Okay, I guess we're going to go ahead and get started here as we last time. So well, welcome to the boot camp. I'm Frank Roth. I already know that. I forgot the, any of the products with my picture on there. Uh, we'll be together the next three days with just one goal, and that's to make everybody here a, a competent mobile home park investor. So we're going to show you how to find properties, evaluate them, negotiate them, renegotiate them, finance them, do due diligence on them, how to properly buy them, close on them, turn them around and operate them, and even sell them. So it's going to cover absolutely everything. Uh, we don't have a lot of structure in the class, so basically you're always free to ask questions at any time. You don't have to wait until break. You can just interrupt me at any time with a question. Just try and keep it on topic to that segment. So we're talking financing, making them financing. And a manager's not very manager. Uh, put the slide here. Oops, hold on. Other goals, we, we designed this class to try and give you complete facts. We, don't, there's, there's, we have nothing to sell you. We don't sugarcoat anything. So this is just this is a very factual-based class, more like a college class on the mobile home park industry. Uh, we're going to show you all the different ways to buy and operate parks. There, there are lots of different business models and niches and things people do in the industry. So we'll show you all those different ones, some of which we don't do, uh, but we're going to show you all the different ways, different things you can do. <coughs> we're trying to help you prioritize what's important from what's not. One problem with mobile home parks is since it's so new to people, they go out to the park and they freak out and not able to actually tell initially what's important and what's not. We're going to try and show you what's important and what's not important and even give you little formulas we've come up with and even little tricks and things to, so you can you know, get rid of the stuff that's not important and focus on what is. Uh, we're going to show you lots of outside-the-box approaches. This is the youngest of all the real estate segments, except possibly self-storage. And so nobody has a complete handle on it yet. There's nobody who's dominant in the industry. There's nobody who's the LeBron James of local home parks. There are, there are people out there who do a good job. There's some people who are fairly large. There are big, very big ones that fail. ARC was among the largest in the U.S. and they failed miserably. Right? So there really is not anyone that great. When I got into business, there was one group that everyone thought was the best, which was called Chateau. And then Chateau sold their stuff off and they've all got away. Uh, but there is nobody out there today that you can say, oh man, I want to be like that guy, because there is no that guy yet in mobile home parks. So there's, you, you may be that guy, because nobody is the guy so far. What caused the ARC to fail? What caused the ARC to fail? They, 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 they tried to do an industry roll up very quickly with very low buying scrutiny. So if your park was for sale, if you were breathing, if you could sign a contract, they would buy it from you. And the whole idea would be they wanted to roll up a giant mass of parks and go public. So they did, they did accomplish the roll to giant mass, they did accomplish the go public part. Then came the problem they actually had to have earnings. Right? When you're paying two times what you should be paying, it's really hard to produce earnings. So almost immediately they failed, they went into workout mode, they fired everybody. I mean, the, the, the investors basically had a revolution, they overthrew the company, they got rid of the founder, they got rid of everybody. It was like, how can we get our money back out of this mess? And ultimately what happened is one of the largest private equity groups that was involved in it, they, they couldn't bear to lose their investment, they had a hundred million in it. So they actually bought out the company, took it private rather than liquidate down and lose the money. And they were still battling to try and turn it, I don't think it can be turned. I mean, it's, it's literally like, they're, it's like they're trying to save the Titanic. It's almost painful to watch, so they, you know, they, they try everything they can think of, you know, super glue, bubble gum, uh, everyone to blow up party balloons and stick it in there, it's not, it's not working out very well. And they, and they slowly have been liquidating selling very small pieces of their portfolio off in, in a series of auctions, <clears throat> but they're still not getting anywhere near the pricing that they pay. So that, that's what happened to them. They, they, they blimped all the way up to 50,000 lots before they blew up. So you can, you can be big and still not know what you're doing very well. Um, everything we show you in the class, because we own and, and have owned so many parks, and right now we, we own 7,200 lots. So we're the 20th largest owner in the U.S. We're in 17 states. That's just this portfolio. You add the old portfolio that Dave and I have had in the past, we've had 10 to 12,000 lots, right? Which, which may sound kind of big, but bear in mind, uh, Equity Lifestyle has 150,000 lots. So, uh, but we, we haven't had enough lots at this point. Everything we tell you, we can back up with a story of what happened, because we've tried almost everything. So we can give you, like, scientific examples of data of, of how different things you can do work and don't work. Um, and then of course tomorrow we're going to show you the real life in, in the field mobile home park business. Some of the parks in which we've owned in the past. 
Uh, many of them we don't, but we're, we're familiar with them. So that, that's the plan. Tomorrow we'll be actually at the field. Um, again, on the rules, you can interrupt me at any time. I, there's, there's no question and answer period. The entire class is a giant question and answer period. Uh, when we're out on property, don't make fun of the people. Even though their lifestyle may be pretty depressing, don't, don't say, gee, what an idiot, because they're probably going to be standing there in the yard. Or, you know, don't, don't throw peanuts to them or, or something. Uh, you know, whenever, even when we're, we have so much material to cover that even more tomorrow when we're out on the bus, I'm going to keep talking while we're on the bus. So we have just a continuum of, of discussion the entire time. Um, we have absolutely nothing to sell you. You, by virtue of being here, own everything we've ever written or done. So you can, you can relax. We don't do coaching or any other crazy stuff. So basically, this, this is this is the whole deal. Um, all right, let's uh, go on to background. Uh, you know, basically, what happened was Dave, Dave and I have always owned parks. We've owned them for almost three years. And if you own a few parks, this business, there's so few people who either own parks or own very many parks, you get asked to speak at things. And Dave and I were invited to speak at an event called Mobile Home Millions. Right? When you see an event with the name Mobile Home Millions, you should run because that's, a, that's such a freaky name. You know there's something weird going on. So we, we go to this event. They, 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 they basically give us free air tickets to go down and speak at this event. We go down there because we're curious as to what's going on. And they, Dave and I just randomly ended up eating lunch at a subway. And we said, wow, man, th this material is awful that they're, that they're going over. We could write such better stuff because this is all crap. So we decided we would each write a little book. So early on, we just wrote little books about the industry, <clears throat> just kind of for fun. And then we started compiling those books into that thing now, which you see the home study course, because we had too much overlap. One book would have the same thing as the other little book. And so we put them all into one giant, giant book. And then people said, well, gee, books are neat, but we really like it more of like a boot camp format. Can you do that? So that's what we got into doing this. So this has is, this is, been kind of organically grow. It's never really been a big goal for us to do boot camps. Um, Dave and I have almost identical lives. It's really weird. Uh, I live in a small town of about 5,000. He lives in a town of about 5,000. We used to drive the same car. We both had silver Dodge Durango's. Uh, we also, Grant, do you still have a Shih Tzu? No? Yeah, see, we even had the same dog. Okay. So, but we didn't know any of this originally. We were just in different universes. All, all I used to know of Dave was I would get these letters from Dave wanting to buy my parks out. Because Dave used to do these huge great mail pieces. And then Dave recently unearthed a letter I wrote back to him or an email or something. No, not just before email, a fax or something saying he's an idiot to quit bugging me. So that was my earliest contact with Dave. Right. Um, but, but today we buy all of our stuff together. We used to never buy anything together. For the last several years, we've only bought stuff together, and uh, it's worked out really well. So when, when, when I tell you stuff, it's going to be not a combination of my life, but also Dave's, because I know Dave's life just about as well. So I'm going to give you a framework of, of a lot of different experiences in the park business from all, all, all different parts of America. You know, I, I live in Missouri. <clears throat> Dave lives in, in Colorado, because of that our, our portfolios were a little different in the past. But at any rate, so that, that's that. Um, uh, also, you know, Dave and I are obsessed with the golden rule. We like to try and all, always over-deliver. If, if there's anything we don't cover over these three days, let, let, let us know. If there's any document you need that you don't find on your thumb drive we're going to give you, let us know. We'll happily give you anything we want, that you want. I mean, we, we've got a big stockpile of forms and documents and junk all over the place, which we will happily give you if you can just tell us what it is that you want. Also, if you have any deals already that you're looking at and you want me to look at it, I'm more than happy to do that. I can do it during lunch. I can do it during dinner. My family is back in Missouri. I got nothing to do here, so I can look at anything you've got up, up until I go to sleep. So uh, always feel free to show me anything you've got. Okay, so we we'll start with a mobile home park pop quiz. You know, what, what are these items? Uh, what is this item here in a mobile home park? This is not a bucket full of, of vomit. What, what is this? <laughs> Grease? So, grease? No, that's not grease, but that's a good answer. It looks like grease. And you would find a lot of grease in the mobile home park. That is sure. okay. This is a kind of a mom and pops water water closet thing for the connection to a mobile home. What you have here, this is where your water line would connect. That little knob, you turn that to turn the water on, and then that's their idea of winterizing. They threw some insulation down. Okay. And you know, in Texas and Oklahoma, that actually works because it doesn't get really cold enough that it's a problem. That would not work in North Dakota at all. all 
right? Okay, this is not a Vienna sausage. What, what, is, what is this? This is a, does anyone know what this is? Gas line? Yes, yeah, it's a gas line connection, correct. Uh, this again, this might be gas, might be water, you don't know what a park, but it's another, another utility connection from another ground, basically. This is your good old power meter. There's all kinds of weird nuances and tricks in power, so we're going to go over all those in the class, most of tomorrow in the field. This, this would obviously, this would be an underground power system, right? If I wanted to know how many amps that that, that, that box contains, in other words, if I bring in a 100 amp mobile home under that space, how can I tell how many amps that thing is? Does anyone know that trivia question? Yes. Look at the breaker. Look at the breaker, right? You, you'd, you'd open up this, this plate right here in this box and go in and add up the numbers of the breakers, which we will do tomorrow on the field, right? What is this? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is, and what's missing? The meters, right? The, the, uh, the part business, one of the big shifts that's happened in the business is that most of your homes in the southern states are now all electric. <laughs> that's the way they're building in the factory. So over time, all these gas meters are disappearing. The other problem you have is a lot of times these old mobs and pops built their parts under master meter gas. And when you have master meter gas, you only have one giant gas at the front and giant meter. Then the park owns all the rest of the lines and meters, and they start failing over time. They're very expensive to fix if people to get out of it. So the, the, the gas business is kind of going away in the park. <coughs> Here would be a, a telephone box, and then these, these random concrete pads you see in parks, that this could be like we used to have an old shed. Some people just you know went out and bought some concrete, put it in their own little patio. You never really know. We'll see someone will walk here tomorrow. I'll show you what are the important concrete things for the non-important concrete things. Uh, but those are just some random things somebody laid down there. <coughs> but what is this? This is that, that typical water water box again, but, but the, is, it, is this a, a approved city way of covering your water box? <laughs> no, right, you know, only in Texas. Now, a lot of states, this is what you'll find. A lot of moms and pops, they, they are very miserly. You do not want to spend you know, $3 to do it the right way, if they can get away spending $2 to do it the wrong way. So rather than buy the correct cover for this box, you can just put a plank over it, right? What do you think the problem is with this idea? Yeah, if someone's going to walk through this park someday, they're going to go right through that, they're going to break their nose, and they're going to sue you for 50000 bucks. That's what that is. If your insurance agent goes through and sees things like that, they go insane. If the city goes through and sees things like that, they go insane. But again, moms and pops, this is the kind of junk that they do. But what is this here? Sewer? Uh, no, I mean, this is a storm shelter. You'll see these in a lot of parks. You know, everyone knows that mobile homes don't do well in tornadoes, so they tried to build shelters in a lot of parks. The shelters are more screwed up than the tornadoes are. Most of the shelters that we get, if you go in those doors, look in there, you're going to see about a foot of water and about a thousand snakes. That, that's what's in about every storm shelter in America. Uh, it's just the nature of the beast. Most of these shelters we have, the first thing we do is shut them down. So that's what most operators do. The, the shelters, like this little shelter here, we've had parks where you'd have a shelter like that for a 100 space park. You have a 100 space park, you better figure you've got two to 300 people, right? You think you can get 300 people in that little building? <coughs> How many of you can get in that building? 50, okay? So you have the big tornado blow through, 250 people can't get in the building and they'll get blown away and killed. Then what really happens? The suit, class action lawsuit, just how it was. So basically, most park owners today, first thing you do is you check with the city, and the state to see if you have to have a shelter, and if you do not, you shut your shelter down. They're, they're, not, they're not a good amenity to have around. What is this? Man, you know, most people look at this and go, oh, this is unacceptable. The, the, this, again, the mobile home park business, most, the part that we do, the affordable housing segment, the people don't have a lot of money. So this may be fine. This may be a guy making a routine repair to his car. Now, these people cannot afford to go down to Firestone or somewhere to get their car worked on. They have to do it themselves. So they're the ones who go out with all those, those lots you see selling auto parts, and then they go back, jack it up, and do it. If that car was like that for a day or two, we would be okay with that. If it was like that for a month or two, that isn't going to work. You have to be a little open minded because people predominantly do not have any money. When you shut down the storm shelter, mm -hmm. what does that involve? Do you just 
close the door? And yeah, what we do, what, what we've done is take a steel plate, and there's many ways you can do it. When one way, so you never know in the park business when you when you get out of an amenity, you never know if the next buyer is going to want that amenity, and they're expensive to build, right? So you wouldn't want to take out an amenity that some guy wants later. It'd be crazy. So you just seal them off. Like you can take a, a big steel plate, and put that over where the door is around it, the concrete, and just basically, you know, put that into the concrete so that no one can ever open that again. But just let it go wild. All those snakes and things are all in there, just going crazy and whatever else. You don't really care. You just want to seal it off. Right? If, if if the next owner wanted to reopen it, you just take the steel plate off and you you do it. We've actually taken, for example, in laundry buildings. We've, we've actually tacked all the doors shut, so it's impossible to get in. But yet, you could go out and break the weld if you wanted to to reopen it. So but that's what we're trying to do. Okay, what, what is this a picture of? That's a water line. This is what the, this is what corrosion will do to a water line over decades. Most of these parks are built with galvanized metal lines, and so they all have a little bit of this going on in every park in America, pretty much. It's not a big issue, to be honest with you, because thankfully water is not dangerous. <coughs> So it's a whole different story if it's gas, okay? Like, let's say this is a gas line. And I've had gas lines like this. That's a problem. Okay, that will explode and kill people. Water, all it's going to do is make greener grass and happier trees, as long as you're willing to pay for it. So uh, a lot of times what park owners do, they, they will all have some form of corrosion in the line, but they don't really deal with it unless the price gets too high for the water that's being lost. That's normally what makes people do something with it or not. We, we have, I, I have never, Davis pipe repiped one time a park in the PVC. I've never had to repipe a park. I've had parks that look pipes just like this, and you end up just doing segments of it over time. You know, you'll do one 100 foot section in the PVC, and then you'll stop, and maybe a year later you'll do another section. Maybe you don't do another one for several years. But uh, the, the corrosion is not a big deal, except in gas. I mean, the gas, it's a huge deal. Yes? What's the longest you've gone in the park? Long as I've ever owned the park? Uh, almost 10 years. Yeah, Dave and I have both, since I guess we're identical with cars and dogs and everything else, we've also had, had a deal where we cycle through parks at a rate of about every seven to 10 years. Uh, normally what happens is we'll buy a park at a really good buy that's a total dump, and then fix it up and season it, and then somewhere over its life cycle we'll get an offer to sell it at a huge profit and we'll sell it and do it again. Right. There, there are people out there who hold parks forever. The only problem you have in forever is almost every asset has a peak, no matter what it is. Or there was one moment when you should have sold. If you mentally think I'm never going to sell, so that when people call you up with offers, you say I don't, I'm not going to sell. We think that's that's probably crazy because everyone should sell at the peak. You just don't know when that peak will be. Here in Dallas, where there's a park out called uh, Spring Creek Mobile Home Park on Highway 75 between Dallas and McKinney, and you know, never goes out that way. You know, their their peak moment was back in. The, Gosh, it was in the 80s. The guys wanted to tear it down and redevelop a giant shopping center there. They should have sold. It was worth, that was the best time to ever sell a park. The problem was that, that, and many of the people who owned it thought they should sell, but that park is sold and had 30 different owners in it. Because as people died, they left it to their kids. And the 30 couldn't decide. So they didn't sell out. The park today is worth probably half of what it was in its week. So they, they should have sold. And does this does this work? This is a case of a guy trying to move a mobile home, which is about a ten to twenty thousand pound object, with a suburban. You know, we, we have this happen about once a year. It always has it always has the same ending. You can actually pull that mobile home with that suburban straight, as long as it's flat. You can go straight with that mobile home for a really long time. But when you turn, you roll the home over. That's what happens. It doesn't even that that hitch can no way handle the forces on that when you turn it. So that, that's what happens. So what will happen is that guy will go out, you know, as long as the driveway's straight, he'll get right out of the park, and then he'll take a ride in the whole home, and he'll just roll over there. <laughs> right, the clockwork. So it, it costs around $3,000 to move a mobile home today in the U.S. It's one of the best parts of the industry, that way the customers can never leave. Uh, and, and the way you have to do it is you have to use a license mover, and they have a special toter truck for mobile homes with a giant Hitch on it. They would see the toter truck rise with this giant hydraulic hitch. So that, that's the big difference. Is the Suburban may have as big an engine maybe as the toter truck, but it doesn't have the giant hitch and the whole mechanics to it. Yes? 
does the three include uh, uh, setting back up? Depends on, where, depends on where you are. I mean, if you're going to include it, the setting back up and the stairs and the AC and so you're probably closer to five. I mean, Todd, Todd, who's the president of our management company, is here. The black shirt is Todd back there. You have a minute there. There's Todd. Then we got Brandon uh, right there in the orange shirt. Todd, what do you think it would cost to move a home from point A to point B? Five yeah. is probably a Five is a closer number. Right. Every place is Every place is different. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. We'll start at two, and by the time you get down, it's five. Yeah, it depends on how far you're going. depends on what the requirements are in the state, on the lot, all kinds of stuff. 